Well, good morning, City Light. My name is Joe, and I serve as one of the pastors here. Uh, and this morning, we get to talk about relationships. Does that sound good? We're going to talk about gospel community. So this morning's going to be a little family therapy session. So just sit back, grab some coffee, grab a donut. I'm sure the college students who are here are thinking, oh, I wish I would have just made next Sunday my first Sunday uh, after I came back. But uh, uh, the reality is, as we talk today um, about how God called us to live in relationship with one another, is that when you meet Jesus, um, you don't just start attending religious services or, or become a part of a, a crowd, but we're, when we meet Jesus, we're called into a unique family. And that family is called the church. And so uh, the thing on the table for us today is we're going to be talking about how the gospel, which is what Jesus has done for us, uh, now shapes the way that we live life and do relationship with each other. And so that's where we're going. If you're new, you need to know that we are in week three of our four-week core value series. If you've been here a little while, you know that our normal pattern of preaching is that we choose a book of the Bible and we just go straight through that, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Um, we just finished our Romans 8 series this summer, and here in a couple weeks, we're going to kick off our series in First and Second Samuel. But every year around this time, we take a step back, and we do what's called our core values series. And now our, our hope in the core values series is that uh, we get a picture into what the heartbeat of our church is what we believe about Jesus and what he has done, and what we believe then that informs our lives and how that informs our lives as individuals, um, as, as, as members of a new family, and then as missionaries as well. And so our core values are represented by four arrows. Um, and, and I think we've got a picture. The first and most important arrow is the down arrow. The down arrow is the gospel. The good news that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, suffered, and died to reconcile a people to himself and to the Father. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's the big arrow, the down. Every other arrow, the up, the in, and the out, are in response to the down arrow, to the gospel. And so last week, John Randall spoke on up, which is gospel formation, the idea is that when we uh, give our lives to Jesus, we start to fight sin and we start to be formed into the image of Jesus, that Jesus is faithful over time to make us more and more like him. And today we're going to be discussing the in arrow, which is gospel community. And so that's what we're uh, going for specifically this morning. We're going to talk about how, how the gospel forms the way that we relate to each other as followers of Christ, um, and how to live out the truths of the gospel together as a family. And as we talk about community, the order here is important. The gospel comes before community. The goal of the church is not community. The reason why we walk through the doors and gather together as a church body on Sunday mornings and then scatter together as city groups into the city, the goal of that, the primary goal is not community. The primary goal of the church is to worship and glorify Jesus Christ. That is the reason we gather. That is the reason we scatter. And also out of that, the fruit of of that, the fruit of worshiping and glorifying Jesus can flow a real, authentic, and mutually beneficial gospel community. So we can't put the cart before the horse with any of our core values. All of them are formed and informed by the gospel. And City Light, this is why this matters for us today. Uh, as we walked in the doors this morning, I know we all came from different backgrounds. We all have had different experiences with other Christians in our lives and different experiences with Christian community in our lives. Some of you walk through that door and you've had amazing experiences with other Christians. You've had amazing experiences in community and you cannot wait to get here on Sunday morning. You cannot wait to get to city group during the week and, and you are here every time the church gathers in some way. For others of you, waking up and walking through that door this morning was more of a discipline. Trying to be a part of a city group is more of a discipline. 
because you haven't had great experiences with other Christians. You've been hurt in a church or by church leaders, whether it was in a, a different one or in this church. But my hope is this morning that wherever you're at, whatever your experience with community is, good, bad, in between, my hope is that the gospel would inform us this morning on how we are to live with each other, that the gospel would show us what our identity is and then what that means as we live together as a new family. And so uh, we've got about 30 minutes and three points this morning, so let's go ahead and jump in. My first point is we are redeemed into community. Now, before we start talking about the do, how do we do community, how do we do life together um, as a family, I want to take a step back and give us a bigger picture um, and show you a larger story that's going to help us to make sense of our, of our personal stories. And so if you've ever asked, why do I long to be known by others? Why do I long to be around other people? Why does humanity not thrive in, in isolation, but then at the same time ask this question, why are relationships sometimes very, very difficult? Even with people I care about, even with people I like, this is a battle sometimes. Well, the Bible's going to speak to that, so let me show you. Look with me at Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, he created them. And so we see here that part of our very created nature as image bearers of God is to be in community. Look at the pronouns that are in use there, us and our. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. The us and the are are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You see, God exists in community. God exists in perfect community with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he has made us in his image. And so we were made to not be in isolation, but to be in community with one another. Now, there's a problem here, isn't there? Do you notice I said that the, the relationship that God has in the Trinity is perfect? They're, they're in perfect unity. It's a perfect relationship. But our relationships together are not perfect, right? It didn't take very long in this story of creation for things to go very, very wrong. In chapter 3, we see our first parents disobeying God, doing the one thing that he said would bring them death. They sinned. And with that first sin, the whole order of the world was changed from that point forward. And so, not only was our relationship with God fractured, but our relationships with each other as well. Immediately, Adam blamed Eve for his part in the sin. Not ten verses into the next chapter, we see their oldest child get jealous and murder their youngest child. Ever since that first moment of sin, our relationships with each other have been fractured. So the result of that is now we have husbands that, that neglect and abuse their wives. We have kids that um, are disobedient and rebel against their children. We have kids that bully other kids. We have people in authority who use that authority to take from people and to oppress them as opposed to blessing them and leading them well. Our relationships are now marked by drama and conflict. And so there's a reason there's a tension here. There's a reason that you are at the same time drawn to and frustrated and repulsed by people. Do you see this? You were created with community in mind. However, sin has broken that, and it has not been the same ever since the beginning. And here's the thing. This is likely nothing new for you. You've heard this. Like, yeah, you didn't have to tell me that relationships aren't perfect, right? 
But this is incredibly important to understand, the order here, that you are created for this and we are broken. And the reason that it's important to understand this is because this is not something that we can fix on our own. This is not something that we can just throw a little bit of effort at it and it's going to be fixed. This is not something that's going to be changed by changing our laws. This is not something that's going to be fixed by having harsher penalties. This is not something that's going to be fixed by legislating compassion. This is not something that's going to be fixed by sensitivity training. These things are all band-aids on a dead body. The only thing that can fix our relationships with each other is by fixing what went wrong in the first place. So this is so important to allow the gospel to form everything about us, including our relationships with each other. If we rely on our own efforts, we're assuming that what went wrong just needs a little fixing, just needs a little bit of help, maybe a Band-Aid here or, they, but the, here or there. But the reality is that our relationships, like us, are dead in our sin. And there's only one person that makes dead things come alive, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. So church, here's why this matters for us. It is very, very important for us to understand the tension here, that our identity as created beings means certain things about us as we are created in the image of God, that there is a reason that we desire to, to be known and loved by the people around us. However, it's, it's more important to know and to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. We have a new identity. And our identity is not in what the people around us think of us. Our identity is not in our relationships. It's not in our marriage. It's not in our kids. It's not in anything other than Jesus Christ. Because the thing is, when that gets broken down, if our hope is in those things, our faith is going to get broken down as well. But when we're sinned against, when we sin against other people, if our hope and our identity is in Jesus, we can then have freedom to extend forgiveness and grace to the people around us, amen? Because you have experienced the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ that you didn't deserve in the first place. So there's no such thing as a lone wolf Christian. It's in our very created nature to be in relationship with others, and through the gospel, Jesus is redeeming us back to that created nature. So church, I want to ask you, have you felt the effects of this sin in your relationships? How have you felt the effects of sin and death in the relationships with people around you? Have you felt this rub from a pastor or another leader, from a friend, from a spouse, from a parent, from someone in your city group? Listen, the story that God has written around here is amazing. We've seen Jesus do amazing things. Two weeks ago, we baptized 46 people from City Light Omaha. Jesus is saving. He is moving. He is working. He is sustaining marriages. He is providing for people. But here's the thing as well. I've mourned with people who have been the victim of infidelity in their marriage. I have seen families at war with each other. I've seen best friends slander each other, and it can feel very dark, feel very, very broken, and without Jesus, it can feel completely hopeless. And yet the gospel says that there is hope for us all, that there is power in the gospel to change not just how we relate to God, but how we relate to each other as well. When we recognize our sin, that Jesus is overcome and forgiven, we can extend that forgiveness to others. City Light, we were created to live in relationship with one another. The bad news is that we've messed that up. We've messed it up with our sin. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is not only redeeming us back to himself, but into, with relationship to each other as well. Now let me show you how the gospel has the power to shape the way we relate to one another. So point two is we are adopted into a family. Look with me at 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. 
Every year, my wife and I host a big Thanksgiving meal for our families. It's, it's her family and my family and all the extensions from there. We usually have about 40 to 60 people uh, in our home. And every Thanksgiving, as I take a step back and kind of look over the room, a couple of things stick out to me. Uh, the very first thing is, under no other circumstance would these human beings be caught together under the same roof at the same time. <laughs> Seriously, we've got strong Republicans and staunch Democrats. And Thanksgiving is always right after the election, so that's a fun little experiment. Amen. <laughs> we've, got, we've got professionals that have jobs and work nine to five. And we've got a few 30-somethings that are very, very good at playing video games in their parents' basements. We've got sweet little babies and, and growing young families, and we have what I can only assume are Civil War veterans. <laughs> but seriously, even in the food that we prepare, we see the differences that we have amongst my family. We've got a real turkey with real meat, and then we've got a vegetarian vegan turkey. We've got, we've got uh, gluten-free stuffing, and gluten-only stuffing. <laughs> We've got amazing homemade desserts that will change your life. And then over in this corner, we've got gross packs of Little Debbies. <laughs> Seriously, it looks like my kitchen, and my kitchen looks like uh, Walmart and Whole Foods had a weird baby. <laughs> but also as a part of, of when we get together, we have this tradition of before we eat, we've got this bread and, and we uh, all take a little piece off of it and we send it around. And, and everyone, when they take the piece of the bread, they say what they're most thankful for over that last year. And do you know the number one thing that people say every time what they're most thankful for? It's family. Family. The people in that room, the thing that they are most thankful for over the last year is the other weird people in that room. And here's the thing, it has very little and almost nothing to do with the things externally they have in common, but they have an affection for each other because of the things that actually bind them together. So church, 1 John 3 says that if we are in Christ, we are called the children of God. And so we are adopted into a new family when, I put, when we place our faith and Jesus Christ. And then it's important here, it says that, beloved, we are God's children now. Now, the word now is very, very important because what that means is nobody started in the family of God. We all had to be adopted into this thing. So this is important. No one started ahead of anyone else, and no one in the family of God is ahead of anyone else. Does that make sense? None of us were deserving. We were all undeserving orphans that were adopted into a family that we never deserved to be a part of in the first place. Jesus Christ came down from heaven to a dead people who rejected him, who insulted him, who wanted nothing to do with him. And what did he do? He gave his very life for those people so that they can be adopted into a family and have relationship with a God that they had no chance of ever having a re relationship with. Church, this is what binds us together. This is why our family is so diverse. Do you wonder why our family is so diverse? Because God adopts a diverse group of people into his family. And we never graduate from the fact that we do not deserve to be in this family, but we are in this family together. So the thing that binds us together is not that we think the same, it's not that we look the same. It's not that we share this common set of values. It's that Jesus Christ has saved us from our sin. That is the one thing that binds our family together. Now, every family also has family traits, right? And our Heavenly Father has set the trait for our family and the culture for our family. It was love that motivated God to adopt us. It says there in 1 John that we are God's beloved. Who we are is a people who have experienced the love of God. And it's love that should mark and define the way that we now relate to each other. Look with me at John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35. 
A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now notice it doesn't say, what will set you apart is that you'll look like each other. Notice it doesn't say, what will set you apart is that you'll think like each other. It doesn't say, what will set you apart is you guys will all live in the same area of town together. No, it says your love for each other is what is going to set you apart. And City Light, can I just say that this week as I was preparing this sermon, that I've just been celebrating the love of God that you guys have shown each other. I was just taking inventory of some of the stories that I've personally been able to see into and and, and to experience myself um, I can remember more than one time uh, where someone had lost a job. And, and uh, the, usually this was, was in a family where it was just one income, and so that one income lost their job. And, and what I've seen is city groups wrap around them, wrap around those people, raise money to pay bills, buy groceries for the family, but then also offer encouragement and prayer in what can be an extremely dark and encouraging, er, discouraging time. I remember a a, a single mom of of young children whose husband had just left her and had abandoned her. And so more than one city group wrapped around this mom and and helped her find an apartment and uh, helped gather a bunch of furniture so they could furnish the apartment and buy diapers and baby clothes and groceries. They set this, this, this mom up who, who just had her world kind of fall apart in an apartment, fully furnished, with groceries and people checking in on her, loving her, uh, and pointing her to Jesus. We've literally had thousands of meals with three, thousands and thousands of pounds of cheese provided <laughs> for new moms. and <laughs> Lots of bacon, too. Lots of bacon. Praise the Lord for the bacon. Provided to new moms and, and people who are in the hospital or just getting back from the hospital or people who have lost loved ones. City Light, you guys have been awesome. And the big thing in, in, in all of these is not that resources have been given or practical needs have been met, although that is big. That, that's a thing. Uh, the, the big thing in all of that is that the love of God was showed and felt amongst the family of God. And so, church, can I tell you how I hope this continues to get played out here at City Light Midtown? I want us to be a church family where not everyone thinks the same, but there's a mutual and real love for each other. I want us to be a church where not everyone looks the same, but there's a mutual respect and real love for each other. I want us to be a church where the elderly are not seen as uh, in the way for young leadership to be able to step into place, but, but the elderly are loved valued, respected. I want us to be a church where children are not seen as a barrier to get out of the room so the adults can talk. I want us to be a church where children are welcomed into every room so that they know they are a loved and valued part of this family. And so there's a few ways that this core value has shaped the way that we do things around here in the gathered and scattered church. The first one is I just talked about it. Kids are welcome. Anytime the church gathers, our kids are welcome as well. We want them to know that they are not a nuisance, but we want them to be and to worship with people that are older than them, the people that they don't get to see every day. We want them to know that that is their family, that they are valued members of that family. Also, you notice it's always pretty bright in here. It's a little cloudy today, but we still keep the lights on. Now, we could change that. We could black out all the skylights and the windows and and turn the lights down and have spotlights and things like that to to just provide a different atmosphere. There'd be nothing wrong with that, but we do this intentionally. We do this intentionally. We keep the lights on. We keep it very bright. We do it here and out at West. We do this intentionally because this. We're a family. We want you to see the other members of your family. We don't want the focus to be primarily what's going on up here on stage, but we want to see each other's faces as we worship Christ and read from his word. We want to do this intentionally so that we can see church is not a building or a place with programs, but it's a people with a purpose. And you sit every Sunday morning and you worship with those people, you worship with those in your family. 
Also, we don't have a million programs for every different person, but we want our scattered church, which is city groups, to largely mirror our gathered church, welcoming and loving people with differing backgrounds and in different stages of life. So church, what does this mean for us today? If we're a family, what does that mean for us as we sit here today? Well, the reality is, is that we're not going to accidentally drift into loving each other. We're not just going to naturally kind of flow into that, but it's going to require intentionality. Brian Loritz in his book, Letters to a Birmingham Jail, says this, if our vertical reconciliation with God required intentionality, then our horizontal reconciliation necessitates that same intentionality. So I just want to press in two things, two challenges for you, two points of application, two very, very practical things. Uh, that my hope is will uh, coach us in being able to love each other well. Number one, invite someone over for dinner. Seems simple. It is simple. It, it seems kind of elementary, like, okay, invite someone over for dinner. I thought you were going to change my life with this. Well, here's the deal about when we sit around the table and eat is it tends to break down barriers. It, it, it tends, we tend to be a little more comfortable when we're sitting around and eating together. There's something that happens when a family gets around a table and eats together and so my challenge is for you to invite someone over to your house. I don't care if you don't like your carpet. I don't care if you don't like your countertops. I don't care if you can only serve macaroni, cheese, and hot dogs. In fact, Waverly, my daughter, would love that. We, we will take that invite at any day of the week. But invite someone over for dinner. So here's the challenge. Very practical. Everyone in this room. In the next two weeks, have someone over for dinner. Maybe it's someone from your city group. Maybe it's someone that you just met today. Maybe you're going to go intentionally meet someone today so you can invite them for dinner. It won't be super awkward. Now, one caveat, college guys, this doesn't mean it's a free date for you, okay? I just want to throw that out there. You're trying to receive that. I'm saying that's not what that's about. Second, let's move towards those who are hurting and not run away. Very practically, what this can mean is visiting people in the hospital going to funerals of, of family friends of people that are in your city group. If you notice somebody has not been at church for a while or city group, give them a call. Bring them a meal. Show them that you love and care for them. Just go spend time with people that are hurting. Now, I know the insecurity here because I've been there, and I'm, I'm there all the time still. When people are hurting, we have no idea what to say. It's like, how do I enter into that? I have no idea what to say, but here's the deal. This is what we have to remember. It's not, us, it's not up to us to fix it, okay? It's not up to us to fix the thing that is wrong in their life, but when we can show up, when we can say, yeah, we love you, we care for you, we don't know what to say, but we just want to know, want you to know that we're here for you, that's what they need. That's what they need to hear from you, not that you need to fix the problem. So go, run towards people who are hurting and not away. Now, if you're an introvert, there's a good chance that by this time in my sermon, you're ready to crawl into a hole right now. Can we just name it? And so uh, if that's you, I would say two things to that. Number one, deal with it. Like, oh, he's full of grace today. That's great. Here's the deal. You are called to spend time with the people and the family of God. Extroverts are told that they should read their Bible and pray alone in the quiet We've all got our crosses to bear, okay? And one day, we're all awaiting for Jesus to come back and wipe every tear from our eyes, so deal with it, okay? And second, and probably a little more importantly, is that God created you. He saved you, and he equipped you to uniquely bless those in the family of God. Church, the family needs you. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God's good stewards of varied grace. So the third and final point is this. We are equipped for community. Now notice two things about this verse. The first thing is everybody has received a gift. If you are in Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit has come gifts. And then the second one is that that gift, the purpose of that gift is given to serve one another. 
So the gift is not for you. The gift is not about you. The gift is not to, to put you up on a pedestal, but that gift is actually for the people around you. God gave away his life for us, and so we give away our very lives for, our, for each other. Do you see how the gospel shapes the way we even use our gifts? So this points to the upside-down nature of the kingdom of God. The world looks at us and thinks we're crazy for giving things away to each other, time, talents, money, resources. We use our gifts to benefit each other and not ourselves, and in that way display the gospel to the world around us. We are representing a kingdom that's not of this world. So now you might be asking, okay, but, but what are my gifts? And for that, I'm going to steal a helpful line I once heard from Gavin. If you notice a hole in the church, if you notice something that is not being done, that might be your gift. Now, I do need to clarify, your, your, your gift would be filling that role, not pointing out the hole. Okay? I know some of us feel like, yep, that's our gift, pointing out holes. Right? But no, it's, it's to fill whatever the void is, whatever the role is. So maybe you've wondered why we haven't done certain things to engage with and, and, and work in the neighborhood. Well, quite frankly, we've been waiting for you to lead that. Maybe you've seen that there are single moms here and you're not quite sure if enough is being done to help them. Well, I'm glad you asked because we've actually been waiting for you to press into that and to lead into that. Maybe you're wondering, okay, this dude with a beard, he gets up and he asks for new serving team members literally every week. Why do they keep asking for serving team members every week and during the Sunday and during the week and then uh, to help disciple our kids in the back? Well, here's the deal. I've been waiting specifically for you to sign up. And seriously, once you specifically sign up, we'll stop asking. I promise. We've been waiting for you to step into that role. Whatever it might be, your gift is not primarily for you, but for those around you to specifically build up the body of Christ and glorify Jesus. And so I want to challenge you. If you're already on a serving team, thank you. But invite someone to come and serve along with you. If you're not on a serving team, sign up for one. There's plenty of things that we can do to help each other around here. If you're giving of your time and your talents, if you're tithing, if you're giving of yourself for the benefit of the body of Christ around you, thank you. We are all in this together, following our leader, our king, our creator, Jesus. And if you're not, can I just stand here and unashamedly ask you to contribute? This is not primarily about me or any of the pastors or the staff or the leaders here or anything like that. It's also asking you to contribute is not primarily about the people around you. Although having everybody to contribute does create a healthier church, but really this challenge is for you. And this is why. As we grow as disciples in Christ, we care about ourselves less and less, and we care more about others around us more and more. And so if you are not contributing, I want to just stand here and ask you, would you contribute? Would you find ways to give of your time, your talents, your resources to the greater good of the people around you and to the glory of Jesus Christ? So City Light, let me close with this. I just want you to know how thankful I am to be a part of this family. My wife, Whitney, and I were both on staff here, and many times we're, we're looking to how can we point people more to Jesus? How can we... Um, give more to the body of Christ. But can I tell you that you guys have pointed me to Jesus Christ. You have given more to me than I ever could to you. You've given me space to confess sin. You've given me space to, to mourn. You've given me space and encouraged me to, to lead in the way that God has called me to lead. And I know that when I walk in here, you guys don't see me as a paid professional, but as a brother in Christ who's broken just like you but also clinging to the hope of Jesus Christ, just like you as well. And so church, may we always be a church family that is experiencing the gospel and then allowing the very love of God to shape how we serve, encourage, and love one another. And I'm confident that if we simply hold on to Jesus and we're intentional to care about each other in very real ways, that the watching world will see a picture of heaven and be drawn to what God is doing here. Let's pray. 
Well, Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you for this family. Thank you that, that when you created us in your image, you were creating us in your image. And so we were created not to be alone in isolation, but with others. So, Lord, I just pray for this church, for this local body of Christ. Would, would, would those things be ours in increasing measure? Would we love each other in increasing measure? Would we contribute to the body of Christ in increasing measure? And in that way, show the world an upside-down kingdom that is full of people who love each other more than they love themselves. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.